Please join me in our call to worship. God, you are a God of invitation. You invited Abraham to follow you. You invited the disciples to drop their nets. You invited the children to draw near. You invited Peter to walk on water. You invited the tax collector to dinner. You invited the Samaritan woman into eternal life. 
Just the same, you invite us to live lives of faith. Give us the strength to say yes. Let us worship God. Our scripture reading this morning comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 14, verses 22 through 33. Immediately he made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone, but by this time the boat, battered by the waves, was far from the land, for the wind was against them. And early in the morning he came walking toward them on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, saying, It is a ghost! And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat, started walking on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he noticed the strong wind, he became frightened, and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying to him, You of little faith, why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. Here ends our reading. It had been a long week, not just for Jesus, but for all of us, although Jesus was especially tired. It had been a rough week. People hear this story, they tend to focus on what it is, eating a the walking on water thing, they often miss what happened at the beginning. People skip right past the fact that John the Baptist had been executed. Maybe it's because readers nowadays don't fully understand the politics of Jesus's time. You see, when when John was arrested, it wasn't really a big surprise, but we all figured they'd let him go eventually. None of us thought that John would actually be executed. And Jesus took it really hard. He'd always had this special relationship with John. They were related, but I can't remember exactly how. And Jesus said that John had known who Jesus was before Jesus was even born. Before John was even born, actually. And when Jesus was ready to start his work, he had asked John to baptize him. So Jesus was the kind of tired you are when you are grieving. You know, that sad kind of tired. But it seemed he couldn't get away. People kept wanting to be around him. I suppose it's because they were sad too. And like us, they knew that Jesus could help them to not feel alone. So when he finally got a chance to get away, he put us into the boat and he said he would catch up to us. We might have thought we knew what he meant, but we didn't. We didn't have a clue. And just before dawn, the waves were huge. It wasn't like a huge storm, but the waves were so big. Even if we had wanted to, we wouldn't have been able to get to the shore in those waves. I don't remember who saw it first, but there was this figure that seemed to be moving towards us. We actually wondered if it could be a ghost. But it wasn't. It it was our teacher. It was our friend. It was Jesus. He must have heard us yelling that it was a ghost because he called out, take heart. It is I. Do not be afraid. So I'll be honest. I'm not sure why I did what I did next. I just felt compelled to do it. I called out to him and I said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. What was I thinking? I mean, honestly, what was I thinking? But I did it. I stepped out. I stepped out into the swell. People talk about that moment like it was some big show of faith. But I'm not so sure. After all, I was just doing what Jesus had told me to do. I would have followed him just about anywhere. I took a couple of steps, just a few, and I admit it, I was surprised. I was actually walking on water. I had been a fisherman my whole life, and I knew how water worked. 
And I couldn't explain this. I was actually walking on the water as if it was solid ground until I wasn't. As a firm a foundation as the water had been moments ago, it was nothing now, and I went under faster than I could imagine. I was sinking, and nothing I could do to stop it. So I didn't even try. As my hand, as my head went under, under, I reached my hand up, and with my last breath, called out, save me. Every day we wake up, God willing, put our feet on the floor, and face the world of uncertainties. All of us deal with uncertainty in different ways, and uncertainty affects us differently too, some far better than others. Uncertainty can cause us to unravel, and we can agree that in one way or another, 2020 has been full of uncertainty and plenty of unraveling. Peter, one of the better known disciples, is grappling with a lot of uncertainties in our scripture passage this morning. He's uncertain of who the ghostly presence is. He's uncertain of what to do in the storm. Once he's told to get out of the boat, he does so, but then he's uncertain about his actions. And as we readers can be uncertain about what this passage is trying to tell us, there are so many unknowns and so many questions, just like life. Many times throughout the pandemic, the analogy of all being in the same boat has been made. We are indeed battling the same storm, but I don't think we're in the same boat with regards to the pandemic. However, we are all in the boat of uncertainty, and that causes many of us to be fearful. Fear is a powerful emotion. It can drive us to act and take risks, all the while distracting us and clouding our judgment. Fear can also paralyze us. Fear makes Jesus unrecognizable to Peter. His arrival is so unexpected at the time that the fear is heightened. Biblical commentator Liz Barrington Forney writes, it seems to be a central aspect of the human experience that our fears and superstitions blind us to the arrival of the holy. She then goes on to say, in the same way, it seems to be a central and blessed aspect of the character of God, that God stands ready with a word of comfort and calm to soothe us. Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. Jesus speaks and makes his presence known, but Peter, still uncertain, says, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. I don't think Peter is testing Jesus. I think Peter is trying to be brave, wanting to be with Jesus, whose presence seems to make all things better. We know people like that. But Peter is unsure. Yet if Jesus tells him to do it, it's the nudge that Peter needs to take the risk and get out of the boat. I don't interpret that as a person who has lost faith, just someone who needs a little reassurance. Have you ever experienced a time when you really wanted to do something and you knew you could do it, yet you couldn't bring yourself to stepping out until someone you loved and trusted told you to do it? It's easier to take risks when you know that someone's got your back. Lucky for Peter and lucky for us, Jesus has us covered. Like I said, I don't know why I stepped off the boat. I know that people, I mean, normal people can't walk on water, and I'm not sure why I thought that I could, but I did want to try, at least part of me did anyway, and when he told me to, I couldn't stop myself. So I stepped off the boat. I did it. I'm not sure why I started to sink, maybe because I realized I wasn't supposed to walk on water. Maybe it's because I realized I'm not Jesus. I'm just a normal guy. Maybe it's because I looked down. Maybe because of all those things combined. I wasn't sure why I was out there. And once I realized I couldn't do it, I started to sink quickly. This is why so many people say I lost faith. Of course, they spend a lot of time debating what I lost faith in. Did I lose faith in myself? Is that why I couldn't keep going? 
or worse? Did I lose faith in Jesus? Did I suddenly find myself doubting that he could keep me afloat? I don't really think it was any of those. I don't think it was ever that simple. Don't get me wrong. I've had my moments. I have said and done things I am not proud of. There are stories about me in the Bible that I wish weren't there, but this story isn't one of them. This story is one that I think we all need to be reminded of from time to time. Did I lose faith in myself? Did I start to think that I couldn't walk on water and then start sinking? I suppose yes, but I didn't think I could walk on water when I stepped off the boat. Men can't do that, so I never thought I could, at least not alone. Did I lose faith in Jesus? Did I ever think for one moment Jesus couldn't make me walk on water? Maybe. But the answer to this question is complicated. I struggled to understand the power that Jesus had, and I struggled to understand how he would use it. I had seen him do great things that I couldn't make sense of. So I don't know if I really knew beyond a doubt that he could do that, but that wasn't what I needed to know. All I needed to know that was that I trusted my friend. I trusted my teacher. If he commanded me to step out of the boat, if he asked me to step into the swell, I would, without a second guess. I might not have understood his power, but I understood my friendship with him. I don't know how I walked on water, even for a step or two. I don't know what made me start to sink. But I do know that when I called out for help, there was no doubt in my mind that my teacher, my friend, that Jesus would grab me by the hand. I knew that when I called out for help, I would be given help. I've learned a lot of being around Jesus and going on this journey. I've learned that faith ebbs and flows. Sometimes I have it in spades, and sometimes I have to dig really deep. But it's in that ebb and flow that we're able to grow. Even though I was there, I'll never fully be fully sure of what happened. But I do know when I called out for help, I did so without fear. I knew he was there. I knew he would catch me. I knew it without a doubt. There are so many things to be uncertain about. And when we feel that we are drowning in uncertainty, sometimes reaching out for help seems like an impossible task. Why do we resist asking for help? Maybe it's pride, or maybe we don't wanna be a burden for others. As Christians, we are called to love our neighbor. And one of the ways of doing that is to be there for one another. When we don't ask for help, we're denying people of the opportunity to be disciples of Jesus. We are not in this alone, ever. Peter's cry for help is an example of his trust in Jesus. I don't recommend waiting until we're drowning to reach out, but we should take note that Jesus is there. Jesus is there along with a boat and his friends. We are never alone. While I was preparing this sermon, I came across a description of this story that was comforting to me and also allowed me to see so much of myself in Peter. This is the story of a faithful follower who becomes overwhelmed by the circumstances surrounding him, who begins to lose his nerve when he discovers the odds stacked against him, but who from Jesus finds a steadying, delivering hand. Doesn't that description ring true for all of us? We all have been overwhelmed at one point or another, causing us to not really lose faith, but to let the fear and uncertainties of life overshadow it. We can doubt ourselves, but Jesus doesn't doubt us. And we can reach out to those who are ready with an outstretched hand to pull us back into the boat if necessary. The world is scary and uncertain, but we are called to step out in faith as disciples of Jesus. And know that even in the midst of life's storms and unraveling, Jesus will never abandon us and always reach out to us. Amen.
Holy One, we pray to you this morning, seeking you to come to us, here in our boats that feel so small and so swamped, in seas that feel battered by waves of grief, of uncertainty, of change. We feel far from land, solid ground, sure things, familiar territory, safety. The wind blows hard and makes everything harder. Any efforts to make things work, to make things better, to get things back. We are at sea, O God, and that is where we seek you in prayer. Thank you for coming to us here. Thank you for your words of assurance, calling us to take heart and to know your presence with us even in, especially in, these stormy days. You are with us, and you call us to be with you. You call us to step out and to trust you. Strengthen our faith, we pray, to help us step out of the boat, to help us move forward without fear, to help us keep our eyes on you and where you lead us. We pray for others in their own battered boats. We pray for those swamped by grief, knocked off balance by the loss of loved ones. Hold us tightly, set our sights on the hope that is ours, and buoy us with your peace that passes understanding. We pray for all who continue to suffer during this pandemic with illness, with lack of work and resources, with distance from loved ones, with people's resistance to care for others if it limits their own desires. We pray for communities reeling and seeking a way forward as it becomes harder to pretend that we don't see the waves of injustice that keep beating upon those who look different, those who have less. Call us to open our ears to hear their cries, to open our minds to understand their truth, to engage our wills, to stand up, to speak up, to step out in faith. This morning we lift up to you Sharon, Rich, Matt, and Aaron. We lift up Herman and Nadine, Shirley and Howard, Vicki, Glenda and Ron, Jarl, Susan, Aaron, Jen, and Jerry. Show us your way through these stormy days, O God. Keep our eyes on you, lest we let fear of discomfort or change, conflict or failure, keep us from following you. These and all the prayers of our hearts we pray, thankful that you are with us in the midst of it all. We ask all of this in the strong name of Jesus, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever, amen. There's a difference between planning and preparation. We can't plan the future that God holds, but we can prepare for each day by practices of generosity. Generosity helps us to forgive and to heal. It helps to make peace in the world. It helps to bring justice and mercy to those in need. Our gifts this morning are one way we prepare for God's coming into the world in the most unexpected ways. Let us gather our gifts together, though we are apart, and offer them to God in gratitude and praise. Monetary donations can be made on our website, www.goshenchurch.com, or by mail, P.O. Box 216. Please look at your e-blast for many other ways you can give to support the ministries of our church. As a sign of solidarity, let us now say our common commission together. Let us now go forth into the world in peace, being of good courage, holding fast to that which is good, rendering to no person evil for evil, strengthening the faint-hearted, supporting the weak, helping the afflicted, honoring all people, loving and serving the Lord, and rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. A blessing on us before we go. God, you invite us in and send us out. You send Abraham to a new land. You sent the disciples to seek new followers. You sent the children to show your wonder. You sent Peter to build your church. 
You sent the tax collector to show your generosity. You sent the Samaritan woman to share the living water. Just the same, you send us to live lives of faith. Give us the strength to go with courage. Give us the faith to invite others in. Amen. Amen.